Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This file is being recorded for the June 2022 edition of Socialism for All, and it's an audiobook and discussion of draft theses on national and colonial questions for the Second Congress of the Communist International by Lenin from 1920. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe, and consider supporting on Patreon at patreon.com slash socialism for all. You can find a link to Patreon in the video description. So, this file was written on the 5th of June, 1920. It was first published in June, 1920, according to the manuscript, and checked against the text of the proof sheet as amended by Lenin. The source is Lenin's Collected Works, Second English Edition, Progress Publishers, Moscow, 1965, Volume 31, translated by Julius Kotzer, HTML markup and transcription by David Walters and R. Sambala, and it's online at the Lenin Internet Archive within the Marxists Internet Archive, marxists.org. Thanks as usual to MIA for hosting this and thousands of other free Marxist texts. Please go check them out. So, there is a note that starts this off. It's fairly lengthy. Notes to preliminary draft theses on the national and colonial questions were received by Lenin from G.V. Chicharin, N.N. Krestinsky, J.V. Stalin, M.G. Rafas, Y.A. Preobrzinski, N.D. Lipinski, and I. Nadelkov, or N. Shablin, representative of the Bulgarian communists, as well as from a number of leaders in Bashkiria, Kyrgyzia, and Turkestan. Along with correct ideas, the notes contained certain grave errors. Thus, Chicharin gave a wrong interpretation to Lenin's theses on the necessity of support for national liberation movements and on agreements with the national bourgeoisie, without due regard for Lenin's distinction between the bourgeoisie and the peasantry. With regard to this, Lenin wrote, quote, I lay greater stress on the alliance with the peasantry, which does not quite mean the bourgeoisie, unquote. Referring to the relations between the future socialist Europe and the economically underdeveloped and dependent countries, Prayer Brzezinski wrote, quote, If it proves impossible to reach economic agreement with the leading national groups, the latter will inevitably be suppressed by force, and economically important regions will be compelled to join a union of European republics, unquote. Lenin decisively objected to this remark, quote, It goes too far, it cannot be proved, and it is wrong to say that suppression by force is, quote, inevitable. That is radically wrong, unquote. A grave error was made by Stalin, who did not agree with Lenin's proposition on the difference between federal relations among the Soviet republics based on autonomy and federal relations among independent republics. In a letter to Lenin, dated June 12, 1920, he declared that in reality, quote, there is no difference between these two types of federal relations, or else it is so small as to be negligible, unquote. Stalin continued to advocate this later when, in 1922, he proposed the autonomization of the independent Soviet republics. These ideas were criticized in detail by Lenin in his article, The Question of Nationalities or Autonomization, and in his letter to members of the Political Bureau on the formation of the USSR. So that's the end of the first note. Let's now begin the text. In submitting for discussion by the Second Congress of the Communist International the following draft theses on the national and colonial questions, I would request all comrades, especially those who possess concrete information on any of these very complex problems, to let me have their opinions, amendments, addenda, and concrete remarks in the most concise form, no more than two or three pages, particularly on the following points. Austrian experience, Polish-Jewish, and Ukrainian experience, Alsace-Lorraine and Belgium, Ireland, Danish-German, Italo-French and Italo-Slav relations, Balkan experience, Eastern peoples, the struggle against pan-Islamism, relations in the Caucasus, the Bashkir and Tatar republics, Kyrgyzia, Turkestan, its experience, Negroes in America, colonies, China, Korea, Japan, and Lenin. June 5, 1920. 1. An abstract or formal posing of the problem of equality in general, and national equality in particular, is in the very nature of bourgeois democracy. Under the guise of the equality of the individual in general, bourgeois democracy proclaims the formal or legal equality of the property owner and the proletarian, the exploiter and the exploited, thereby grossly deceiving the oppressed classes. On the plea that all people are absolutely equal, 
The bourgeoisie is transforming the idea of equality, which is itself a reflection of relations in commodity production, into a weapon in its struggle against the abolition of classes. The real meaning for the demand for equality consists in its being a demand for the abolition of classes. So that's the end of point one. Let's just break that down real quick. So the bourgeoisie is trying to make weapons for its struggle against the abolition of classes. Why does the bourgeoisie or the capitalist class not want to abolish classes? Well, in capitalism, they're the ruling class. They like being the ruling class. It gives them enormous wealth and they don't really have to work for it. So one of these weapons, Lenin says, is an abstract or a formal posing of the problem of equality in general and national equality in particular. So basically the capitalists try to pose these questions as divorced from class relations, like equality in general. Anybody growing up in a capitalist country or spending significant time in a capitalist country has heard this, you know, the uh, equality of all before the law. But in reality, money buys power and so the rich have more rights. So this is an illusion. It is a lie told by capitalists. As Lenin says and concludes with, the real meaning of the demand for equality consists in its being a demand for the abolition of classes. You want real equality, then the abolition of classes is the only real pursuit there. Capitalism is lying when it says that it can provide real equality. On to point two. In conformity with its fundamental task of combating bourgeois democracy, and exposing its falseness and hypocrisy. The Communist Party, as the avowed champion of the proletarian struggle to overthrow the bourgeois yoke, must base its policy in the national question too, not on abstract and formal principles, but first on a precise appraisal of the specific historical situation, and primarily of economic conditions. Second, on a clear distinction between the interests of the oppressed classes of working and exploited people, and the general concept of national interests as a whole, which implies the interests of the ruling class. Third, on an equally clear distinction between the oppressed, dependent, and subject nations, and the oppressing, exploiting, and sovereign nations, in order to counter the bourgeois democratic lies that play down this colonial and financial enslavement of the vast majority of the world's population by an insignificant minority of the richest and advanced capitalist countries, a feature characteristic of the era of finance capital and imperialism, comment, aka later stage developed and consolidated capitalism. So I think that this point is fairly clear just to summarize. The fundamental task of communists is to combat the empty, false, hypocritical promises of capitalist democracy, the kind of social systems that capitalism offers, the sort of equality for the rich, rights for the rich, and sort of, you know, an echo or shadow of these, you know, a pale reflection of these for the other classes, if even that. Many people don't even barely get that. And in order to pursue that, communists do three things which make our process fairly distinct from what the capitalists do. First, we precisely appraise specific historical situations, paying special attention to economic conditions. Second, when we talk about interests, we don't want to just talk about national interests as a whole, which usually just reflects the interests of the ruling class of that nation. If we're talking about a capitalist nation, then we're talking about the interests of the capitalist class, which as we know, are diametrically opposed to and antagonistic to the interests of the vast majority of the exploited population. So instead, we want to not just talk about national interests and leave it at that. We want to talk about the interests of the oppressed classes. Third, we want to not just do this within a nation when we're analyzing a nation, but also apply it to international relations. Is one country exploiting another, etc.? What is the interest of the rich exploiting country versus the underdeveloped exploited country? Point three. The imperialist war of 1914 to 18 has very clearly revealed to all nations, this was World War I, of course, and to the oppressed classes of the whole world, the falseness of bourgeois democratic phrases by practically demonstrating that the Treaty of Versailles of the celebrated Western democracies, quote unquote, is an even more brutal and foul act of violence against weak nations than was the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk of the German Junkers and the Kaiser. 
The League of Nations and the entire post-war policy of the Entente reveal this truth with even greater clarity and distinctness. They are everywhere intensifying the revolutionary struggle both of the proletariat in the advanced countries and of the toiling masses in the colonial and dependent countries. They are hastening the collapse of the petty bourgeois nationalist illusions that nations can live together in peace and equality under capitalism. Comment. So the brutality both of World War I itself and of the post-war treaties really expose that there is not going to be peace under capitalism at all. These are just lies. The ruthless competition and drive to dominance that is characteristic of the capitalist economic mode is only going to drive the revolutionary struggle of the proletariat within the imperialist countries and then also of the working classes in the colonial and dependent countries just closer to revolution and against capitalism. Point four. From these fundamental premises, it follows that the communist international's entire policy on the national and the colonial questions should rest primarily on a closer union of the proletarians and the working masses of all nations and countries for a joint revolutionary struggle to overthrow the landowners and the bourgeoisie. This union alone will guarantee victory over capitalism, without which the abolition of national oppression and inequality is impossible. I think that one's pretty clear. Internationalism. Closer union of the proletarians and the working masses of all nations and countries for a joint revolutionary struggle. Point five. The world political situation has now placed the dictatorship of the proletariat on the order of the day. World political developments are of necessity concentrated on a single focus, the struggle of the world bourgeoisie against the Soviet Russian Republic, around which are inevitably grouped, on the one hand, the Soviet movements of the advanced workers in all countries, and on the other, all the national liberation movements in the colonies and among the oppressed nationalities, who are learning from bitter experience that their only salvation lies in the Soviet system's victory over world imperialism. 6. Consequently, one cannot at present confine oneself to a bare recognition or proclamation of the need for closer union between the working people of the various nations. A policy must be pursued that will achieve the closest alliance with Soviet Russia of all the national and colonial liberation movements. The form of this alliance should be determined by the degree of development of the communist movement in the proletariat of each country, or of the bourgeois democratic liberation movement of the workers and peasants in backward countries or among backward nationalities. So comment there, Lenin is here making a distinction between the level of economic development of a country and consequently the social system that it has. So we know from historical materialism and the procession of the modes of production, Feudalism precedes capitalism. Capitalists overthrow the feudal monarchies to establish their bourgeois democratic republics, and then the proletariat created by capitalism eventually overthrows capitalism and establishes a socialist republic. But, you know, depending on how backward the country is, it may be at a different point in that process. So in the more advanced countries, this is the struggle of the proletariat against the bourgeoisie. In the more backward or more underdeveloped countries that do not have advanced capitalism and they have not had a bourgeois democratic capitalist revolution yet, then in those countries it's going to be a bourgeois democratic liberation movement of the workers and peasants. Point seven. Federation is a transitional form to the complete unity of the working people of different nations. The feasibility of federation has already been demonstrated in practice, both by the relations between the RSFSR and the other Soviet republics, the Hungarian, Finnish, and Latvian in the past, and the Azerbaijan and Ukrainian at present, and by the relations within the RSFSR in respect of nationalities which formerly enjoyed neither statehood nor autonomy, e.g. the Bashkir and Tatar Autonomous Republics in the RSFSR, founded in 1919 and 1920, respectively. So, a couple of comments here. There are two endnotes in the text, and then just a comment. So, Lenin is talking about the RSFSR. This is the Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic. The USSR was not founded yet at this point. But anyway, to restate 
So if the idea is international cooperation between the working people's movements in different countries, Lenin says federation is a transitional form of this to the complete unity eventually of the working people of different nations. And he talks about the feasibility of federation being demonstrated by these examples which he mentioned. So to go into the end notes from the text, regarding Finland, as a result of the revolution which commenced in Finland on January 27, 1918, the bourgeois government of Svinhufvud was overthrown and the working class assumed power. On January 29, the revolutionary government of Finland, the Council of People's Representatives, was formed by Edvard Gilling, Irjo Sarola, Otto Kusinen, A. Taimi, and others. The following were among the most important measures taken by the workers' government. The law on the transfer to landless peasants, without indemnification, of the land they actually tilled, tax exemption for the poorest sections of the population, the expropriation of enterprises whose owners had fled the country, the establishment of state control over private banks, their functions being assumed by the state bank. On March 1, 1918, a treaty between the Finnish Socialist Workers' Republic and the RSFSR was signed in Petrograd. Based on the principle of complete equality and respect for the sovereignty of the two sides, this was the first treaty in world history to be signed between two socialist countries. The proletarian revolution, however, was victorious only in the south of Finland. The Svinhufud government concentrated all counter-revolutionary forces in the north of the country and appealed to the German Kaiser's government for help. As a result of German armed intervention, the Finnish revolution was put down in May 1918 after a desperate civil war. White terror reigned in the country. Tens of thousands of revolutionary workers and peasants were executed or tortured to death in the prisons. Regarding Latvia, as a result of mass action by the Lettish proletariat and peasantry against the German invaders and the counter-revolutionary government of Ulmanis, a provisional Soviet government was established in Latvia on December 17, 1918, which issued a manifesto on the assumption of state power by the Soviets. Soviet Russia gave fraternal help to the Lettish people in their struggle to establish Soviet rule and strengthen the Latvian Soviet Socialist Republic. Under the leadership of the Latvian Communist Party and the Latvian Soviet government, a Red Army was formed. The landed estates were confiscated. The banks and big commercial and industrial enterprises were nationalized. Social insurance and an eight-hour working day were introduced, and a system of public catering for working people was organized. In March 1919, German troops and the White Guards, these are counter-revolutionaries, armed and equipped by the U.S. and the Entente imperialists, attacked Soviet Latvia. In May, they captured Riga, the capital of Soviet Latvia. After fierce fighting, the entire territory of Latvia had been overrun by the interventionists by the beginning of 1920. The counter-revolutionary bourgeoisie established a regime of bloody terror, thousands of revolutionary workers and peasants being killed or thrown into prison. And that's the end of the notes. On to point eight. In this respect, it is the task of the Communist International to further develop and also to study and test by experience these new federations, which are arising on the basis of the Soviet system and the Soviet movement. In recognizing that federation is a transitional form to complete unity, it is necessary to strive for ever closer federal unity, bearing in mind first that the Soviet republics, surrounded as they are by the imperialist powers of the whole world, which from the military standpoint are immeasurably stronger, cannot possibly continue to exist without the closest alliance. Second, that a close economic alliance between the Soviet republics is necessary, otherwise the productive forces which have been ruined by imperialism cannot be restored, and the well-being of the working people cannot be ensured. Third, that there is a tendency toward the creation of a single world economy, regulated by the proletariat of all nations as an integral whole, and according to a common plan. This tendency has already revealed itself quite clearly under capitalism, and is bound to be further developed and consummated under socialism. Just one comment there about the integral whole and according to a common plan, and that this tendency was revealed under capitalism. So what we see from the early Wild West days of capitalism, where people just set up shop and it's market anarchy, as time goes on, capitalist production gets more and more centralized and more and more consolidated. Within a capitalist firm, there's a great deal of planning. There's quarterly planning, there is yearly planning, there's multi-year planning. 
As the monopolies increase in size and they put smaller producers out of business, this tendency just advances and advances until in any area of the economy, there are just a handful of different competing operators. However, while this is the greatest scale and greatest degree of planning that has ever been achieved in the economy, it's still done along profit-seeking competitive lines and it is still representative of market anarchy. Socialists here wish to intervene via revolution, take over production, and really bring it into one harmonious plan that is actually cooperative instead of destructively competitive and profit-seeking. Continuing. 9. The Communist International's national policy in the sphere of relations within the state cannot be restricted to the bare, formal, purely declaratory, and actually non-committal recognition of the equality of nations to which the bourgeois democrats confine themselves, both those who frankly admit being such and those who assume the name of socialists, such as the socialists of the Second International. In all their propaganda and agitation, both within the parliament and outside it, the Communist parties must consistently expose that constant violation of the equality of nations and of the guaranteed rights of national minorities, which is to be seen in all capitalist countries despite their, quote, democratic constitutions. It is also necessary, first, constantly to explain that only the Soviet system is capable of ensuring genuine equality of nations by uniting first the proletarians and then the whole mass of the working population in the struggle against the bourgeoisie and second, that all communist parties should render direct aid to the revolutionary movements among the dependent and underprivileged nations, for example, Ireland, the American Negroes, etc., and in the colonies. Without the latter condition, which is particularly important, the struggle against the oppression of dependent nations and colonies, as well as recognition of their right to secede, are but a false signboard, as is evidenced by the parties of the Second International. Quick comment there, that's the second mention of the Second International, and there will be more. So Lenin wrote a lot about the Second Socialist International and its betrayals of Marxism and the working class in the face of World War I and the Bolshevik Revolution. After the Second International lost all credibility, the Third Communist International, or the Comintern, was founded to take the socialist movement in a new communist direction. However, as you can see, Lenin continued to speak against them. They were a stunning example of how much people calling themselves socialists could actually sell out to capitalist interests in practice. Continuing, point 10. Recognition of internationalism in word and its replacement in deed by petty bourgeois nationalism and pacifism in all propaganda, agitation, and practical work is very common not only among the parties of the Second International, but also among those which have withdrawn from it, and often even among parties which now call themselves communist. The urgency of the struggle against this evil, against the most deep-rooted petty bourgeois national prejudices, looms ever larger with the mounting exigency of the task of converting the dictatorship of the proletariat from a national dictatorship, i.e. existing in a single country and incapable of determining world politics, into an international one, i.e. a dictatorship of the proletariat involving at least several advanced countries, and capable of exercising a decisive influence upon world politics as a whole. Petty bourgeois nationalism proclaims as internationalism the mere recognition of the equality of nations and nothing more. Quite apart from the fact that this recognition is purely verbal, petty bourgeois nationalism preserves national self-interest intact whereas proletarian internationalism demands first that the interests of the proletarian struggle in any one country should be subordinated to the interests of that struggle on a worldwide scale, and second, that a nation which is achieving victory over the bourgeoisie should be able and willing to make the greatest national sacrifices for the overthrow of international capital. Thus, in countries that are already fully capitalist and have workers' parties that really act as the vanguard of the proletariat, the struggle against opportunist and petty bourgeois pacifist distortions of the concept and policy of internationalism is a primary and cardinal task. 11. With regard to the more backward states and nations, in which feudal or patriarchal and patriarchal peasant relations predominate, it is particularly important to bear in mind, first, that all communist parties must assist the bourgeois democratic liberation movement in these countries, 
and that the duty of rendering the most active assistance rests primarily with the workers of the country the backward nation is colonially or financially dependent on. Second, the need for a struggle against the clergy and other influential reactionary and medieval elements in backward countries. Third, the need to combat pan-Islamism and similar trends, which strive to combine the liberation movement against European and American imperialism with an attempt to strengthen the positions of the Khans, landowners, mullahs, etc. There's an editor's note here that in his notes, Lenin inserted a brace mentioning that he should combine points two and three. They are very similar. Fourth, the need in backward countries to give special support to the peasant movement against the landowners, against landed proprietorship, and against all manifestations or survivals of feudalism, and to strive to lend the peasant movement the most revolutionary character by establishing the closest possible alliance between the West European communist proletariat and the revolutionary peasant movement in the East, in the colonies, and in the backward countries generally. It is particularly necessary to exert every effort to apply the basic principles of the Soviet system in countries where pre-capitalist relations predominate by setting up working people's Soviets, etc. Fifth, the need for a determined struggle against attempts to give a communist coloring to bourgeois democratic liberation trends in the backward countries. The Communist International should support bourgeois democratic national movements in colonial and backward countries only on condition that in these countries the elements of future proletarian parties, which will be communist not only in name, are brought together and trained to understand their special tasks, i.e. those of the struggle against the bourgeois democratic movements within their own nations. The Communist International must enter into a temporary alliance with bourgeois democracy in the colonial and backward countries, but should not merge with it, and should, under all circumstances, uphold the independence of the proletarian movement, even if it is in its most embryonic form. Comment, good example, China. Sixth, the need constantly to explain and expose among the broadest working masses of all countries, and particularly of the backward countries, the deception systematically practiced by the imperialist powers which, under the guise of politically independent states, set up states that are wholly dependent upon them economically, financially, and militarily. Under present-day international conditions, there is no salvation for dependent and weak nations, except in a union of Soviet republics. 12. The age-old oppression of colonial and weak nationalities by the imperialist powers has not only filled the working masses of the oppressed countries with animosity toward the oppressor nations, but has also aroused distrust in these nations in general, even in their proletariat. The despicable betrayal of socialism by the majority of the official leaders of this proletariat in 1914-19, when, quote, defense of country was used as a social chauvinist cloak to conceal the defense of the, quote, right of their, quote, own bourgeoisie to oppress colonies and fleece financially dependent countries, was certain to enhance this perfectly legitimate distrust. On the other hand, the more backward the country, the stronger is the hold of small-scale agricultural production, patriarchalism, and isolation, which inevitably lend particular strength and tenacity to the deepest of petty bourgeois prejudices, i.e. to national egoism and national narrow-mindedness. These prejudices are bound to die out very slowly, for they can disappear only after imperialism and capitalism have disappeared in the advanced countries, and after the entire foundation of the backward country's economic life has radically changed. It is therefore the duty of the class-conscious communist proletariat of all countries to regard with particular caution and attention the survivals of national sentiments in the countries and among nationalities which have been oppressed the longest. It is equally necessary to make certain concessions with a view to more rapidly overcoming this distrust and these prejudices. Complete victory over capitalism cannot be won unless the proletariat and, following it, the mass of working people in all countries and nations throughout the world voluntarily strive for alliance and unity. So that's the end of the audiobook. Just a comment on this last point. So the emphasis throughout is on unity of struggle between the proletariat in an imperialist country and the oppressed masses which are not necessarily just the proletariat, but also peasantry, etc., in the 
dependent nations, underdeveloped nations that are being exploited by that same imperialist country. So it is a particular kind of international solidarity saying, hey, my quote own national bourgeoisie is exploiting your people as a whole, your whole nation, your whole country. But I, as a member of the class conscious communist proletariat of that country, am your friend. I don't want to uphold that system. I want to help you break it. I want to bring it down from inside and I want to help you bring it down from outside where it is exploiting you and your country. Now, there has arguably been far too little of this. As Lenin notes, even back in his day, the uh, you know first world or imperialist core proletariat was already showing a lot of inclinations and signs that it was predisposed to social chauvinism and not having that international solidarity with not just other workers in comparably developed countries who they might regard with a certain, you know, false bourgeois consciousness as, quote, their equals, you know, workers in the UK looking at workers in France and things like that. You can see this today, like, you know, who are, quote, our people versus not, uh, not just having solidarity with other workers in a similar type of position, but also having the solidarity with the workers whose entire country is being exploited in order that your country can be richer than that country. This has been kind of a constant weakness, and it's something that really continues to need to be fought today. We need to just kind of get over this once and for all in the first world if any socialism anywhere is going to be successful. It's one of the things that's been holding back the drive to world revolution this entire time for over a century. So that, I would say, is the biggest problem if you look at you know this whole thing over the whole scale of time. Lenin is also pointing out that in the exploited country, you also don't want to just sort of like have blanket hate for the entire advanced world, uh, you know, conversely developing, because that kind of blanket distrust also can hamper internationalism. Although, again, we step back, look at the last century, which is in practice the bigger problem. Who is in more of a position to gain? Who is in more of a position to lose? It's definitely the first world proletariat or imperial core proletariat that has been more corrupted, I would say, by their ruling class against that kind of solidarity and internationalism. As Lenin points out, there are you know ways that the ruling class within exploited countries get buy-in and class collaboration from their internal exploited classes. It tends to be you know along maybe fundamentalist religious lines. There's a variety of mechanisms for that. But again, who has access to the most information? Who has access to the most opportunities for travel, et cetera, et cetera, to you know overcome these national prejudices? And develop that solidarity it is of course the imperialist proletariat now there are of course examples of large-scale pushback against that sort of sentiment the vietnam war resistance in the united states i would say is like one of the better examples of it it also was powerful enough in terms of you know kind of forcing that solidarity and and that sort of um class consciousness international class consciousness those realizations, development of more class consciousness, that the U.S. ruling class decided, hey, we got to kill the draft because too many people are getting pulled into this that really don't have any buy-in. They don't feel any sense of agency, as illusory as it may be, those who like do have a sense of agency. I mean, those who aren't just committed like Nazis joining the U.S. Army to like go kill communists in Vietnam. There were some of those. But a lot of people just wound up there as like, go serve your country. And then they realized like, hey, the hell am I shooting at these guys for? Like, you know, who sent me over here? Why? It's so some rich guy can get richer, etc. And starting to realize like that common enemy and like, hey, we should go over to that side even. So uh, this is when U.S. policy started switching to the, quote, economic draft. In other words, having a, quote, all volunteer or poverty induced, like you cut all the social programs, the only way that poor people can get any sort of benefits or college or whatever is by joining the military. Uh, that's been working for them better so far. But anyway, I digress, that's a big topic. Uh, I'm gonna leave it there. What do you think? 
Leave a question or comment below. We'll continue the discussion in the comments section as always. Otherwise, thanks for listening. And thanks to the current patrons whose names are on the screen. If you'd like to get your name on the screen, head to patreon.com slash socialism for all. You can sign up for as little as $2 a month or more, whatever you see fit. We don't run ads on this channel, so that support is vital, and it has allowed me to spend a lot more time producing content than I would have been able to do without that support. So thanks very much to the patrons at every level. Beyond that, once the content is produced and uploaded, engagement counts. So like, share, subscribe, leave comments, even if it's just thanks or good video. All of that helps to boost the channel and makes it easier for people to stumble across this content after listening to maybe something else about social justice or whatever it is. We want to make this content as accessible to people as possible because the world really needs socialism. Thanks again for listening, and we will catch you in the next video.